Um, the topic is obviously assessing the gaps in the market. And um, first of all, um, just to give you a quick overview of what we will cover during the session, it won't be just the typical market gaps that you talk about in terms of demand, supply, and what products uh, we are looking to develop or bring into the market. But we're also going to focus on other gaps in the market in terms of skilled manpower or uh, security threats, utilities, access to finance. Uh, some of these topics have probably been uh, discussed before, but like I said, uh, with the kind of panel that we have, I think it'll be very, uh, very interesting to get their views on it as well. So first off, just to start, uh, I think if we can have a quick round of introduction, introduce yourselves, your experience, and the company that you represent, we'll start with you. I guess I go because I hold the mic. I yeah. have the power. <laughs> Uh, my name is Andrew Langdon. I work for Movenpick Hotels and Resorts. I am the Chief Development Officer. I also the SVP Asia, so oversee Asia as well. Um, short version: Movenpick uh, hotel operator, 85 hotels, 22 in Africa, and uh, with uh, more desires to grow more. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Bernard McCullough from the Senior Industry Specialist for. International Finance Corporation. Um, and to, the IFC is basically the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And uh, part of our mandate is to invest in countries to increase you know, shared prosperity and reduce poverty. Over the years, IFC has invested something like $3 billion, 270 plus projects, over 90 countries, 100 of which projects have been done in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm uh, Philippe Porto, uh, Head of Development for Africa in Indian Ocean for Accor Hotels. Uh, Accor Hotels uh, is a leading uh, uh, travel uh, uh, and uh, um, lifestyle group, uh, innovative uh, digital company as well. Um, we provide end-to-end uh, -end -end services and innovative experience. Uh, to customers through uh, 4,200 hotels uh, worldwide uh, and residences, 10,000 uh, rental uh, homes, uh, finest uh, luxury rental homes uh, through the brand One Fine Stay, and uh, leaders in uh, concierge services with John Paul the concierge. Uh, in Africa, uh, we are mainly present uh, through hospitality, uh, with uh, a 21,000 rooms, uh, 119 hotels on the continent and uh, 10,000 employees. We uh, operate mainly by management contract, but we also own 6% uh, of the network in Africa and uh, we franchise, uh, I think, 19, 20% of the, of the network. Uh, and basically, we are very much involved also in a program called uh, Planet 21, which is uh, about uh, uh, working on the uh, environmental footprint and social economic footprint, uh, which is uh, something uh, uh, which is uh, very s strong for Accor Hotels in Africa. And uh, in that respect, uh, we... We join you. Thank you very much uh, for introducing. Uh, my name is Jair Concesal. I'm from uh, the company Cabo International Partners. We have uh, business interest on the Cap Verde Islands, also known as uh, Cape Verde, for the British and uh, French-speaking uh, Africa, Cap Verde. We have uh, business interest in the areas of tourism and uh, leisure also in uh, logistics and maritime industry, and also in renewable energy and uh, agriculture. And so, uh, yeah, this session is very uh, important to uh, address some uh, analysis on the gaps within the market. We have some gaps uh, in the market on the covered islands, and uh, it's strong correlated to the fast African continent on the west of Africa. I think we're going to talk about it later. Yeah. So first up, Bernard, I'm going to pick your brains because IFC, now you probably have loads and loads of experience in investing in assets, developing assets, owning assets, um, probably an insight over the entire continent. Like I said, you could probably talk for the next 40 minutes if you wanted. <laughs> but just to summarize, where do you see the most important opportunities in Africa today? 
I, I think the, the first one that jumps to my mind is Cameroon. Cameroon in both uh, Yaoundé and Douala, all, all categories, I would say. Togo in the mid-scale market. Um, uh, on the Cape Verde Islands, you know, there's, there's great potential at the moment going on. Uh, Niger is another attractive country, particularly Niamey. There's not even one branded hotel so far opened. There are a couple in the pipeline, but still nothing has come, come to fruition. Uh, Madagascar is starting to show signs of uh, attraction. Uh, if we go to the north, I would say Tunisia is going to come back with a vengeance, yep. uh, particularly in 2018. The, the drawback there would be that the inventory there is a bit tired and needs some investment. Uh, I was recently in Egypt on the Red Sea. The Red Sea is, I would like, you know, unfortunately, the Metrojet bombing has really helped the country, I would say, you know, from diversifying geographically. Previously, all the market was 60% Russian. Yes. Now, if you go to, to the Red Sea region, it's more diversified. And we're starting to see even rates crawling up slowly, slowly. And again, the, the Western market, the Western European and Eastern European market starting to look for, for newer products. Yeah. And just for people to know, what's IFC's mandate as far as, so when you see an opportunity to... I, I think we're mainly debt providers usually, but we also look at the economic impact of a hotel in a country. Yes. So we, we've recently done even certain studies on some of our investments yes. and saw what the rollerball effect and the linkages that, that have been created. And we've got numbers that, that sort of shout, you know, keep on doing more. So to give you an example, in, um, uh, in one particular project in Ghana, the contribution to, to GDP of that particular hotel for 2014 was equivalent to the total revenue of the hotel for that particular year. So, so wow. contributions are high and on an average, the jobs created for when you, when you look at the direct jobs, the induced jobs and the indirect jobs, every room was creating something like 12 jobs in the country. Right. And as a product category, which products do you see um, with, with the most opportunity, both you, in terms of you, you, market you, demand, but also correct. ROI? I, I think, you know, everybody's saying that most of the markets are coming to saturation. Yeah. Uh, I think there's still place for some specific asset categories. In particular, I would say the service department slash apart hotel is the next category that we were going to see great big developments it's starting slowly but we're starting to see the, even the the ascots of this world and the phrases come in yeah uh, i think the other the other potential is obviously the mixed use developments mm -hmm. mixed use in all shapes and forms uh, we still i wouldn't be surprised within the next few years we'll start seeing the mixed use developments that have a hotel with villa rentals where the villas will be or chalets will be sold and put into a rental pool. Uh -huh. I, I could see that starting to, to close. Uh, there's some of them already in, in Kenya. I could see that happening in, in Ghana soon. Yes. And, and I think there is also now space for that boutique-ish hotel that is outside the cookie cut or the box that every other operator does. Something different, something that attracts local flair with a local touch. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, I think, uh, to Jair, um, which are the market gaps that you see in Cape Verde? And also, um, in terms of challenges, um, why do you think Cape Verde could become a tourism destination specifically for leisure? Um, what would make people come to the destination? Or do you think you already have those kind of anchors which are bringing in people? I think you're somewhere around the half a million mark in terms of international tourist arrivals. Uh, what's the ambition? Where do you want to reach in terms of tourist footfall? How do you want to position yourself as a destination? And as a result, what kind of products do you see uh, will be uh, mostly developed in, uh, in, in Cape Verde? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Salih. In Cape Verde, it's in, uh, the market is predominantly uh, leisure driven. And tourism and uh, hotel business is an uh, economic activity that is happening in Cape Verde. It's the first economic activity in the country. It's a young country of 40 years. So, uh, yeah, when it's going to happen, uh, it's in a transition phase. It's probably uh, tour-operator-driven, big uh, hotel resorts. 
and the products that we're going to offer right now are more, uh, let's say, uh, big resorts, all inclusive. Mm -hmm. But we are in a transition phase. Yeah. So we're going to develop uh, under the 10 islands, one country brand. We're going to develop uh, logistics to reach different islands. We have uh, yeah, exclusive products on each island. We have the traditional sun and beach, but we can offer also uh, everything on the maritime, water sports, uh, kite surfing. On the historical side, we have the yeah, very historic uh, sites in Kafert that is important to uh, Africa. We have the oldest church in uh, the capital island of Santiago, yeah. in uh, the whole of Africa. Also the Ciudad Velia, a cultural UNESCO uh, site. So, uh, yeah, we have also uh, mountainous islands that uh, can offer uh, nature lovers that can want to hike or people that want to uh, see volcanoes. So, uh, we can diversify and convert in terms of uh, offerings, product offering, in uh, horizontally and also vertically. Uh, let's say horizontally, in type of uh, where the clients are coming from. They are uh, mainly uh, Western Europe. So uh, yeah, we, we are looking for uh, yeah, the gaps in the market. That's now, uh, we are not receiving, let's say the middle class Nigerians are not coming to uh, Kafert. They're going to, I don't know, to Mauritius, to uh, Dubai, and uh, yeah, we're in West Africa. We are not receiving the middle class uh, yeah, from Morocco. So there is a huge potential for Kafert to uh, grow in that perspective. Uh, last year we received, you said 500,000, but uh, it's yeah. 650,000. Okay. And every year it's increasing with uh, 10%. So uh, in Kafert, uh, it's not, uh, let's say, the demand that's a problem. The supply is a problem of quality beds, uh, high luxury beds. For, uh, yeah, we are now in the transition phase. Uh, so we offer uh, yeah, a lot of uh, perspective for uh, brands and also for uh, investors. Kafert doesn't have a season like uh, a lot of locations. We have, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, 10 days of uh, rain a year. So we have around 350 sunny days a year. And uh, yeah, with that, we can offer uh, investors uh, a uh, very uh, high return on investment. And uh, do you think connectivity and accessibility is, uh, is a challenge at the moment? Or do you think there are some plans, which I guess for a destination like Cape Verde is very critical, right? There are some plans. Uh, we are also, uh, also working in the logistics uh, with uh, the biggest project in Kafert. We are working on it right now. It's connecting all the islands through a fast uh, ferry, uh, high moving vessels. So you have a weekly, uh, daily connection between the islands. So uh, now the tourists, they stay uh, average of seven days in, uh, in an island. But when that uh, connection is established, uh, people will go to other islands, they will stay uh, average of 10 days. So, uh, How long will it take between islands on an average with this um, fast ferry? Let's say the two most touristic islands is uh, Salem Boa Vista. We can connect them uh, within uh, one hour uh, ferry connection. So okay. we can go uh, in the morning and come back uh, yeah, the same day. Okay, let's get some operator perspective uh, with Philippe. What uh, kind of brands are most in demand at the moment from a development perspective, which are the brand which are getting maximum interest from investors or developers, and also which are the hottest markets for Accor? Well, uh, yeah, to, to supplement uh, what has been said, I would say that uh, uh, we have also to, uh, when we try to identify the gaps in the markets uh, and uh, meaning opportunities uh, in the market, we, we, we start as well uh, to look at our endogenous uh, internal factors, strengths and gaps, uh, uh, weaknesses. And uh, uh, from a geographical standpoint, where are we leaders in the region? Where are we not present or new entrants? In terms of segments, uh, what do we have to offer? And uh, crossing with where are the gaps segment-wise. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, then for Accor, uh, we have in the region different uh, strategies, uh, whereby I would say that uh, uh, for uh, North Africa and Western Africa, 
uh, where we are very strongly uh, uh, present uh, and leaders, we are much more selective on consolidating the presence uh, and uh, uh, consolidating the presence and taking opportunity of developing some destinations which are key destinations, the main drivers of uh, uh, the uh, uh, future hospitality market. Uh, in West Africa, we have Nigeria mainly, uh, and it comes to the fact that we are not uh, enough present in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that we have identified two and a half years ago uh, the total absence of Accor hotels in uh, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, that we have partly addressed you now with a, 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 a pipe of 10 hotels, uh, 2,000 two rooms in Eastern Africa, uh, a portfolio of hotels under development in Angola, and we are uh, addressing uh, future developments uh, in Southern Africa uh, to, to, to come uh, to fruition soon. Uh, in, I, I would say that uh, 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 regarding the segments, regarding the opportunities for the segments, in Africa there is, from a general standpoint in Africa, you look at the uh, occupancy rates, for the region, they are the lower, lowest occupancy rates versus all regions. Uh, so why? Because you have a lack of leisure travelers for the time being, the African market, except some destinations. Huh? Uh, but uh, the African region, for the time being, uh, mainly is driven uh, in terms of hospitality by, by business travelers. There is a driver of demand which is identified at the present time and which is under development, which is the meeting, convention, events segment, yeah. uh, which contributes as well to the infrastructure of uh, the countries and of Africa and will contribute to open, of course, uh, the opportunity of a, a new additional flow of uh, uh, travelers and clients, whether they are Pan-African or coming from uh, uh, international destination. Uh, so that mice market, even if it's related to the business corporate market, is a driver which has been identified by the consultants, by the market, and on which we work, uh, uh, we work uh, hard because it's immediate effect. Uh, I agree, um, uh, uh, the, second, uh, the second one, and that's where it's interesting to cross with your internal uh, strengths and weaknesses, is that basically the supply today, the branded supply today in the region, in Africa, is nearly 70% uh, in the upscale and the luxury segment, 30% yeah. in the mid-scale, and two, between 2 and 4% in the mid-scale, in the, the economy, three star. Today, our pipeline uh, and our presence, uh, uh, existing hotels, uh, uh, it is 30% in the three star economy segment with IBIS. Uh, so it's quite different, and 40% in the upscale segment, and 30% mid-scale. We have identified the development of the economy segment, uh, provided it is, uh, of course, spotless, quality, consistent, uh, as a main driver in the hospitality, and especially in some destination uh, where the market uh, is said as being oversupplied in some segments. But in that respect, uh, even if you look at Johannesburg, in Cape Town, uh, you have, which are mature markets, you have absolutely a gap for new developments yep. uh, of hotels of that, uh, in, on that segment. And for us, it's absolutely a, a, a strength and some, something where we can also bring a differentiation in line with the gaps uh, in the market. So it's quite uh, interesting. And uh, finally, uh, uh, yes, there is uh, uh, another gap that Bernard has uh, mentioned, which is the fact that uh, uh, Africa and the African destinations, and some of them which are mature already, like Cape Town, uh, Johannesburg, and some being 
uh, in uh, maturation and uh, very fast maturation, like Nairobi, for instance, uh, uh, need to have a lifestyle, uh, whether you call it boutique hotel, or, but lifestyle uh, segmentation as well, which is going to be absolutely in line with the international cities, whether you speak about uh, Los Angeles, Istanbul, uh, London, with these life lifestyle concepts, lifestyle hotels, which correspond to uh, uh, what uh, uh, the new trends identify and will allow also not only, uh, uh, of course, domestic market being also uh, uh, used by uh, for weekend destinations, nightlife, etc. But also attract uh, the international travelers still more to these destinations. So we have to think really the uh, African market as well in terms of uh, uh, opening concepts which are in line with what uh, international travelers uh, around the world uh, will expect to find in the uh, fine, find in the finest, I would say, destinations where they are, they are used to be. I think it's an opportunity for Africa, and it's an opportunity for us, accord, as we have acquired uh, a, a strong hold in this kind of uh, segment. Uh, with brands uh, like uh, 25 Hours, uh, Mama Shelter, and so yeah. on, which are developed with success uh, for Mama Shelter in Istanbul, Los Angeles, Paris, London, etc. Yeah. yeah, let's get uh, Andrew's perspective as well. Andrew, how is uh, Move and Pick placed in Africa at the moment, and uh, where do you see um, an opportunity in both in terms of market gap and in terms of product? Also, from a brand perspective, is it Move and Pick, uh, you know, some other brands that you're also playing with uh, in this market? Thank you, thank, thank you. I don't think there's any more gaps left uh, after having to listen to Ber, to Berwin and actually, and actually Philip. But uh, I think I can find a gap or two left. Um, in terms of Move and Pick, uh, where we see it, and uh, it's, it, it, it is very much uh, the same that has already been mentioned. But for us specifically, you know, we are at the moment concentrated in more north. Uh, North Africa, we have about 25 hotels, of which about 12 of those are in Egypt, and then a scattering uh, in uh, Morocco, Ga Ga Ghana, and a few other places. Um, so for us, our focus going forward is very much uh, looking at the West Coast, East Coast, and Southern Africa. We see a lot of opportunity there. Yep. In terms of the actual positioning, um, you know, obviously, we are Movenpick. We are one, we are a mono brand in the upscale to upper upscale level. Um, we have seen um, uh, in recent times, and I say within the last 12 months, um, uh, a lot of renewed interest in the Movenpick brand from owners who recognise the benefits of signing a management contract with an operator with one brand. Um, uh, they see the benefits where you've got the whole office yeah. and the support structure and the distribution, you know, all serviced to supporting that one single brand. Um, obviously, because we are one brand too, you know, we, we're floating that upscale to up upscale. Um, I always like to say to owners, uh, if, uh, if you want to build a hotel that's going to give you a uh, uh, really great face and ego, you go and build your five star hotel. If you want a hotel that's going to make you really good cash flow, go and build your three-star hotel. And if you want a hotel that gives you a bit of both, you build a four, build a four-star hotel. And that's pretty much where we are, where where we are actually positioned. Um, and given that we are privately owned, we do have a fair amount of actual flexibility yep. uh, in terms of our brand standards and design, uh, which which puts us in a unique position. In terms of product offering, uh, I think Berna was absolutely spot on. Um, uh, we see there's a real opportunity in the serviced apartment sector, that extended stay, long stay sector, and we have our, uh, our product offering called Move, called Move and Pick Residences, um, and we're currently in negotiation for two of those just at the present time. Yep. We see a very big opportunity in that, um, where many of our competitors don't really have a product off, uh, actual offering 
um, uh, or they have it, but they haven't introduced it to the AFU, to the AFU we can market. Yes. Um, so we, we are hoping to get in front of them. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, y y my colleagues here have mentioned the branded residences, or, you know, dare I say, you brand the villas or you brand the condominiums and you put them into a rental pool. Uh, we see that as a huge opportunity. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, uh, you probably see me have a big smile on my face. Uh, as of three hours ago, we just signed uh, a new deal in Vietnam. It's in Ha Long Bay. Now, this is going to make your gasp. Uh, that's a 500 room hotel. Dare I use the term condo hotel. It's brand, it is brand, it is brand, branded with a mandatory rent, rental pool. Yeah. Plus, plus 300 villas, which we brand and put back into a mandatory rental pool. So that's a 700 uh, room property with a 2,000 pax convention centre and 18 hole golf course. It's under construction and the Vietnamese are going to open it in 12 months. Okay. Uh, we see that as a really good opportunity here. Obviously not on that sort of scale here, but uh, we definitely see that's, that's going to come of age. And the last one is mixed use. Absolutely, mixed use is definitely the way forward. Because let's face it, the return for a hotel for a developer, it's long term. You know, your payback back in Africa is typically 12 years. Uh, but 12? For 12 years, yeah. and that's if it's good. Um, it could easily blow out to a little bit more. Um, but if you do a move and pick, it's 12 years. Okay. I'm not sure about other brands. Um, we'll come to that in a bit. I have a question in mind. <laughs> but yeah, but if, but if you mix it with a retail or branded residential, you, yeah, it, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense. So there's okay. a lot of opportunity out there. Let's hold on to that thought. And before we move on to the other challenges, let's uh, pick someone from the audience. Let's say Annie. Annie has a couple of hundred million dollars. She wants to develop a five-star resort in Cape Verde. How would you be able to help her in terms of what the mandate is with CIP? And Annie's going to come to you three next, so be prepared with your terms. Yes, uh, that would be a great, uh, yeah. Great so you option. can help her with land, incentives, what, is, what can you do for Annie? Yeah, we can uh, do everything from uh, A to Z. Uh, uh, yeah, let's say every project starts with, uh, with the land, depending on uh, what type of uh, hotel. Uh, like they say, uh, we have uh, mid-scale, uh, upper-scale, uh, depend on which island. If you go to uh, Salem Boa Vista, we already have uh, big uh, brands coming in, like uh, Hilton, uh, Redisons, and uh, everything like that. And if you want to have uh, like type of business hotels, you have to go to the capital, where uh, Praia is uh, located. And there's the, yeah, the financial capital, and uh, that is more for, uh, let's say, uh, business hotels. If you want to uh, yeah, build uh, eco resorts, eco hotels, then you have to go to Sandon Town or, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Sunny Cloud. And, uh, yeah, we can assist every developer, every investor in mm. all those uh, aspects from uh, land acquisition. We have uh, a good uh, yeah, uh, relations on the field. We know uh, every uh, plot in Cafert, who are the owners. We can do the due diligence and uh, qualify if there are uh, restrictions on, uh, on building, because in Cafert everything is uh, well defined uh, uh, in a state approved plan. Let's say in the beachfront, you can ne never build more than uh, two or three stories. Let's say the seaside is a public, uh, yeah, public uh, domain. In the 80 meter zone, within the maritime zone, you cannot uh, build. So uh, if somebody is planning to build a hotel with a private, uh, private beach, uh, that those type of developments, uh, you cannot do it in Cafert. But uh, in all the other aspects, we can uh, assist. Uh, yeah, hotel but do you brands. see that as a deterrent to investment? or? Uh, no, it's a, it's a great uh, yeah, regulation that we have yeah. because uh, yeah, people in Cafert, they appreciate the, the, the sun life, the marine life. We have a big uh, biodiversity. Uh, for instance, we are the, the biggest uh, breeding uh, place in the world in Africa for loggerhead turtles. Hmm. And this kind of uh, yeah, uh, natural uh, wonders, uh, the Cafertians, they really uh, appreciate it and they also value it. And, uh, it's also in the government policy to uh, protect everything what is uh, 
big asset for the future tourism uh, industry. Okay. Uh, moving on to Bernard. Bernard, Annie needs some uh, finance as well. She's busy on the phone, but she needs a loan. Uh, what kind of terms can she expect from IFC? And um, how do you look at an investor? Uh, I, I think we, we give more than money. Let's put it this way. So, I mean, we are, prof we'll, we are the debt providers, but we also provide uh, industry expertise uh, through, through our specialists. So throughout the cycle of the, the project, be it at implementation pages being operational, yep. we are there with them and we will be guiding them. I think the other thing is we, we apart from the debt, we would also provide longer tenants. So we know for a fact that in this region, you know, the construction periods, maybe Cape Verde is one of the exceptions where they can, you know, build at a very rapid pace. Uh, I've seen 270 rooms go up in eight months. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, I think, you know, apart from the ten, the, here you have a, in this region, the projects are plagued with delays. So on average, we see, you know, all our projects taking a minimum of four years. So we need to provide a longer tenor, anything in the ranges of 10 to 12 years. We yeah. try to push longer, but typically we go for a 10 to 12 year. Okay. So basically, to sum it up, we get the industry, the expert, you get the longer tenors, and you get the money. And does that include a grace period during construction? Pardon? Does that include a grace period during construction? Yes, yes. And typically, the grace periods, we would be looking at anything between two to three years. Two to three years. Yeah. All right. Okay. Philippe, um, if she wants to brand it as a Sofitel resort, and I know you'd probably not but, uh, be very specific. How much did you say she has? She has a couple of hundred million dollars. Uh, a couple or uh, <laughs> a couple of dozen of million of dollars? Well, there's burnout to fill the gap. No, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, a what kind of terms can she expect from Accor? No, I mean, uh, of course, we, we, we work from, uh, from a phase A with her on the positioning, on the analysis of the market, and... Uh, the best possible design uh, to, to, to meet uh, the demand in terms of analyzing uh, uh, the F&B potential, the, uh, the, the, uh, the residential uh, component that should uh, come with, uh, because we, of course, we do with Sofitel, with Fairmont, uh, with Raffles, uh, with Pullman or Swiss Hotel, we do uh, residential components, uh, whether it is just branded and sold with yeah. a premium because of the brand, or uh, manage uh, in addition to uh, the hotel itself. Uh, so basically, we would uh, define uh, the uh, capacity uh, of the hotel and of its uh, uh, components as uh, food and beverage offer, meeting offer, uh, and residential offer uh, for uh, the best of the market uh, and after going through uh, best use of land, analysis uh, uh, of the market, uh, of the site, uh, and uh, basically uh, have the best mix. But it's also a matter of discussing, of taking into account, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the constraints uh, or the objectives in terms of uh, finance. Uh, you might have to finance the hotel uh, through the sale of the real estate part of the business. Uh, you might have also to structure the management contract with regard to the constraints uh, of the uh, finance provider, of the debt provider. Yeah. We did it in Addis Abeba uh, for a, pro a great project which was in need of debt financing. And we worked directly with the syndicated banks yes. uh, in order to amend, amend the management contract uh, so that the, uh, the, the, the debt providers will be comfortable enough in terms of uh, servicing of the debt, uh, service of the debt and uh, uh, priorities uh, on cash uh, and so on. So like so, a owner priority return? For, I mean, yeah. a bank priority. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, in the management contract, it was an owner's priority, yeah. uh, allowing then the, between owners and bank 
to have uh, the bank uh, secured enough. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's where it comes, uh, uh, I would say, the main gap in this country. <laughs> it's an, we can analyze in terms of segment, but uh, very often it's in terms of financing. Yeah. Uh, whether you have a shortage of equity or you have a limited debt yeah. uh, and expensive and it makes also the beauty of the development in Africa. I've been in Middle East, I've been in uh, Europe uh, and here it's uh, as a, a hotel operator and still more hotel developer being very much upstream in the process. Uh, uh, you have also to, to work with the financing issues and uh, sometimes uh, really uh, uh, take it in hands and make it happen uh, with uh, your network of uh, finance providers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I would say, that's very interesting. But financing in Africa is the key. And very often, it is the reason for the delays. Very often. Yeah. Okay, moving on to Andrew. Andrew, let's let's move on to a bit of uh, challenges let's say from an operational point of view skilled manpower source or uh, access to funding utilities or utility costs what do you see as the key challenges in the market today um, within the hotel industry so what are the gaps in terms of you know uh, this kind of infrastructure mm. uh, basically all 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 of the above <laughs> all of the above um, I, I think for us as an operator, I think uh, probably the biggest issue we see is, uh, is ensuring hotels are delivered uh, you know, ideally on time and to a, stand, and to a level which, which, which obviously we envisioned when we signed the management yes. contract. Um, you know, I was just looking at uh, Moven Peak's portfolio, portfolio, and this is quite stark. Um, on average, for every hotel we sign, uh, the day we sign it, it is the vision of the owner in Africa to have that hotel fully operational within four years. Yes. Okay. We do the DD to ensure they have the financing, the equity, they own the land, da 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 da. In reality, every hotel of ours in Africa, everyone is delayed on average by 2.5 years. So that four years is working out at uh, six and a half to seven years. So the time it takes from signing a management contract on average to have a hotel open in Africa is seven years. That's from Oven Pick. I don't know what it is with a cause, but I guess it's probably pretty close to, to the same. We compare that in Europe, it's three and a half, four years. In, in Asia, it's three years. In Vietnam, would you believe it? It's 24 months. Wow. Um, so um, so that, is, that is the biggest issue. Because yeah. um, you have to understand, when we sign a management contract, we're making a commitment to an owner for 20 years. That, yeah, and that commitment is based on the hotel is going to comprise X amount of rooms and X amount of space, and, uh, and it's going to be open within an X amount of time. And, that's, and we make a commitment that we will manage the hotel on that basis. But when it is de-relayed, de I can tell you that causes a hit on our balance sheet. It comes at a cost to the operator as well, and possibly an opportunity cost where we give up other hotels to potentially manage within the same city because we have made a real commitment to an owner already. So, so, you know, the real issue is working with the owner to ensure that hotel is opened up yeah. you know, in time and to as level and a standard that is going to ensure that it uh, has a good chance of max of maximizing the profit sure and the biggest issue that causes that is money okay the owner doesn't have enough money or they run out of money or the budget blew out yeah. um, but it's it's money um, yeah so that's the biggest issue okay uh but now, next question to you. What other factors do you see as challenges? Security? No, I, I think I'd go a step further. I, I yeah. think any investor that comes into this region 
needs to be prepared for fluctuations. There are fluctuations that are going to happen. There are pandemics that happen. We just need to look at what happened at Ebola. You know, the Ebola crisis did not only affect the three countries, it affected the entire continent. Yeah. So I think though the, the, this, these are some of the major ones, the fluctuations in commodity prices, we've seen it, uh, devaluations of currencies. Yes. So these are other issues that sometimes uh, developers and investors don't, don't even think about these things. Yeah. Uh, that's a fact uh, that uh, and there, there, there were studies, studies uh, showing uh, how good is the hospitality business in uh, different types of economies and uh, uh, service oriented economies the most achieved uh, economies uh, are absolutely uh, producing a, a, a flow of travelers of all on all segments, domestic and international as well, and uh, uh, for uh, uh, the maybe not seven days of the week, uh, 24, uh, I mean uh, for, for the full year, but uh, on the six days or five, uh, five days uh, a week, and uh, you, you complete with uh, the flows of groups of uh, holiday makers and uh, uh, tourists. Uh, today, it's a fact that uh, uh, the economies are not, in general, I'm just speaking about the continent, we can see that uh, uh, the economies are not enough diversified, uh, they are not enough advanced in the, very often in the process of uh, going from raw production to transformation even if some countries like uh, Ivory Coast uh, and uh, some others are taking the matter in hands and progress on that. And then, yes, uh, so the business is depending on the commodity price and uh, oil and uh, etc. But uh, too limited. And we have these kind of fluctuations which are not absorbed by the diversity of the uh, economy. And that's uh, the main aspect for us. And uh, sometimes we have main drivers uh, like Nigeria, which uh, are in uh, difficulty for a period of time, yeah. uh, Angola and uh, other ones. Uh, and uh, yes, that put, uh, that put a, a break on uh, the development of hotels. And hotels are also infrastructure. Yeah. Absolutely. And moving on to you, Chair. I mean, um, you obviously highlighted how Cape Verde is very awesome, but what are the challenges? Yeah, I can uh, go further on that and uh, diversifying the economy uh, for Cape Verde. The economy is not yet that uh, fully diversified because I said uh, tourism and leisure is the first real economic activity in Cape Verde. It's 20% uh, of the GDP of the <coughs> Caverdian Islands, uh, where we say in uh, average Africa, it's 10% uh, of the GDP, hotel and leisure. And we don't have that big constraints, uh, training staff. We have a highly uh, skilled uh, population. 50% of the population is uh, younger than 25. And also in terms of uh, yeah, finding and uh, financing, we have uh, some little challenges, but uh, because we have the good uh, logistical connections, the infrastructure. Yeah. We have uh, 120 weekly flights a week connected with all major European ports. So that will give an operator that has a, a good clientele base the confidence to uh, sign a yeah, good management contract with a, a good project. Okay. You again moved on to the good things. Yes. <laughs> that's fine. Yes, uh, currently the, yeah, the pipeline in Cafert is, uh, yeah, let's say uh, we have 11,000 rooms. Uh, already uh, in a, yeah, such, such a small know. country and uh, in the pipeline for the next three years is approved uh, pipeline of uh, 5,000 uh, rooms in the four and five star uh, segment. So uh, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of space to, uh, to grow. Yeah, talking about pipeline and development and future projects and this question is open to anyone, even from the audience, if we have any investors, owners, developers, there's a lot of talk about uh, green projects as well sustainability and LEED certifications and things like that. Has anyone experienced uh, any such project um, and seen its impact on the ROI? Uh, is it really worth it to invest in a green project? Uh, do you see the benefits, the savings? Uh, does it make for a financial case? Does anyone have any experience with these kind of projects? 
Uh, I can uh, shortly uh, go uh, through on that and I will uh, give the word to uh, Bernard. You already told about the, that you want projects with a great social spin-off. And uh, in Kaffert, we are uh, yeah, developing other, uh, uh, let's say, other economies. Uh, tourism is the fuel for the economy. We're going to use that to develop renewable energy. And Kaffert is now a play field for uh, high-tech companies that want to uh, develop wave-based energy, uh, sun energy, and uh, the most important, wind energy. We have plenty of wind, so uh, we are working on a big project of uh, 1,100 uh, beachfront development in Boa Vista. And we're going to integrate uh, sun and uh, wind energy in our projects, so that they will also have a social, highly impact on the economy. Yeah, just uh, to say that, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, green is a savings, uh, more investment, okay? more expensive on the investment yes but uh, uh, and we have the experience uh, we are hugely involved it's uh, 15 to 20 percent savings on the life cycle uh, uh, so you have a life cycle of the asset that you take for instance for uh, 40 years yep. and you have a 15 percent per year of savings so notwithstanding well, it is good for the brand. and you have much more value of your asset. The valuation of the assets which are addressing, which are meeting the uh, green globe or whatever criteria which are recognized are uh, something which uh, uh, puts the asset on a higher valuation. Ah. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you work on this uh, uh, compliance, then you have access to some financing and I give my micro to uh, we're seeing it more and more. IFC has its own green building certification called EDGE, yes. which uh, a number of companies have already started adapting it. Particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've, we've seen a lot of traction there. Huh. So, uh, as what we've noticed, it's a tool, but what each time we do a study or, a, or monitor a project, the investment, the incremental, the incremental in the investment is very minimal. So you're looking nine times out of ten, it would be a minor cost when related to the total project cost, yeah. and the payback period is within a couple of years. So owners tend to, once they've understood where they could do the savings and what things they need to change, they opt for that. So it's, it's, it's about awareness, basically. If but it's about awareness. If they had more awareness, they would have gone for I, it. I think it's more of educating people yeah. and, and showing them uh, what can be done in the project to actually save more money. Sure. Andrew, would you like to share some thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Let me put it this way. Um, actually, Philippi is spot on. The savings, if you design and invest in all the green things you should in a hotel, yes, you can probably achieve savings of 15%, uh -huh. maybe 20% on certain items. The typical pay we're back is anywhere from five years to seven years now. But this is where it all comes undone. The difference between doing a hotel where you can have those energy savings and green actual attributes, which is yeah. going to give you those 15% to 20% savings, okay, it's going to cost you 5% to 10% more to build that hotel, full stop. So it's very hard saying to an owner that $50 million you have to build your hotel, add another $5 million up front as capex, but don't worry, you'll get that $5 million back over the next seven years. That's yes. the problem. Um, yeah. Owners who are aware of it, not a problem. They go, yep, fine, I'll pay for it. But try and convince an African owner to fork out another two and a half to five million bucks more, it is very difficult. Yeah. Yes, indeed, but uh, uh, through the uh, criteria, uh, applying for having access to the financing, whether it is IFC or others, uh, sometimes uh, it makes the rule of the game and the owners then are incentivized to apply to, to, to these criteria, to this green uh, development. And also the fact that uh, 
even on a piece, uh, a piece of paper, you can demonstrate. Uh, you have 20, 25% maximum of the total cost of an asset, which is going to be represented by the development phase. 75 to 80% is about the, lifestyle, the, the life cycle of the asset. So the maths uh, are demonstrating that you have really to invest this little bit more, uh, and then you will get uh, things absolutely uh, right in terms of uh, profitability, return on investment, and so on. So it's a virtuous circle. Yeah. yeah I would right. uh, like to agree on that, uh, Bernard, because, uh, yeah, you put it in a project, renewable energy, you calculate, and if the figures uh, make sense, it's feasible, and then convert. It's not the uh, yeah uh, something you just do in a project renewable energy. It's uh, it's the state's vision because uh, we are already running on 30% uh, renewable energy. The state's vision is to be in uh, 2030 on 100% renewable energy, and it's not uh, we do it for the yeah let's say to market it as an eco uh, destination, but it's a must. Uh, Cafe relies on uh, very, uh, let's say, expensive uh, oil imports for uh, small island nations. It's uh, it's challenging to uh, yeah to fit that in the state budget. So uh, transforming the economy in a renewable energy economy is uh, yeah it's a it's a must to do that in your project. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of sun hours and a lot of wind, so uh, the return on investment is uh, very uh, high in the Cafe. Okay. Thank you.